From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome Inside the Ice House. No two days are alike here at the New York Stock Exchange. You'll often find a banner across our facade welcoming a new company to the public markets or, or perhaps celebrating a listed company's corporate milestones or new product launch. On this podcast, we've run the gamut of companies listing on the exchange just this year from Pinterest to Uber to Slack to the fashion company Revolve and all the international companies like Tufin and GSX that use their IPOs to not only raise capital, but to introduce themselves to the American investing public. New York is many things, the finance capital of the world, the fashion capital of the world, the media capital of the world. You get the idea. It's also the advertising capital of the world. And for all of the guests that have joined us here in the Ice House, we have yet to really dive into the agency world and speak with the creative minds responsible for turning everyday items into iconic and beloved brands. For example, Coca-Cola, GE, IBM, Levi's, and of course, those are ticker symbols KO, GE, IBM, and LEVI, immediately conjure classic images whether it's Mean Joe Green drinking a cold one or those classic 501s. Needless to say, we're not taking our entrance into the world of advertising lightly. Joining me today is advertising powerhouse Cindy Gallup. Her personal motto, I like to blow up. I am the Michael Bay of business. Strap in for a conversation on brand building, breaking barriers, and being 100% authentic. And now a word from Chip Berg, CEO of Levi Strauss & Company. NYSC ticker L-E-V-I. There's no other brand in the world like Levi's. We're here today because of the dedication of the 15,000 employees that we have around the world. Growth is being driven across the company. Men's, women's, tops, bottoms, outerwear. Virtually every country in the world grew last year. Being associated with an institution that goes back further than Levi's is special. This is where this company deserves to be. Cindy Gallup didn't seek out the advertising industry. It sought her out. Cindy studied at Oxford University and in typical British fashion, fell in love with the theater. Her first job took her to Liverpool, where she spent time giving backstage theater tours and creating marketing plans. A theater goer told her, young lady, you could sell a fridge to an Eskimo. And the rest, as they say, is history. That remark launched a 20-year career in advertising. Cindy got her start at Ted Bates, later making stops at J. Walter Thompson and GGT, which is gold greenless trots, working her way up the ranks and eventually landing at BBH, Bartle, Bogle, and Higgerty, where her 16-year career with the firm took her to Singapore to launch the Asia office and the U.S., where she was eventually named president of BBH New York and later chairman of the New York office and chief marketing officer of BBH Worldwide. If you thought that was the pinnacle of her career, you're not even close. Cindy left BBH in 2005, and she's been a force to be reckoned with ever since. Today, she is an advertising consultant, entrepreneur, she's launched two digital platforms on her own, and is arguably one of the most emphatic public speakers ever to grace the stage. When she's not on stage, she uses Twitter as her microphone, opining on topics such as ageism, advertising, equal pay, gender equality, and many, many more. Cindy, welcome to the Ice House. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. We're happy to have you. Is this your first time at the exchange? Um, It's not, actually. I was last year, probably, and this is how long ago it was, uh, when it was actually possible to come and watch the traders on the floor. So let's start from the beginning. You were born in Brunei, Borneo, which you've said was not as exotic or maybe as exciting as, as people imagine in their heads. Why was that? Yeah. So, um, so ju- just to correct that, I was born in the UK, but when I was okay. six, um, my parents moved to, to Brunei. And okay. so that was where I and my sisters grew up. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, I, I make the point that it's um, growing up in Brunei is a lot more boring than most people think because when I say Brunei, um, I guess the good thing these days is that people have actually heard of it mm -hmm. because back when I was a kid and a teenager, and, you know, for many years, no one had ever heard of Brunei. Now they have some idea of the Sultan of Brunei. They have a sense of where it is. And so there's a feeling that it must have been very exotic. Um, Brunei is a very small state. It has three towns, you know, wow. one one main road. And, you know, while I had a very happy childhood, I have to say that Brunei was not the most riveting place to be if you were a kid mm -hmm. and dying to engage a lot more with the forms of popular culture that one saw in movies and TV. Mm -hmm. And your father is British, your mother is Malaysian Chinese. You must have learned the tremendous values of diversity early on. And what did your parents do in Borneo? And what was that impact on your career and just life? later on? Um, so my parents were both teachers. Um, we moved to Brunei when my father got a job as an assistant headmaster and ultimately went on to be the principal of um, a school and then ended up as an inspector in the education department. Mm -hmm. My mother started a kindergarten which got very successful and eventually became a fully fledged private school. Growing up in Brunei as the child of a mixed marriage was interesting mm -hmm. because my parents met and married back in the late 50s okay. when mixed marriages were not at all common. And so I encountered racism growing up on both sides. Mm -hmm. To the English, I wasn't English. To the Chinese, I wasn't Chinese. And that's undoubtedly something that has absolutely informed my desire to see you know, all forms of bias eradicated so that everybody has access to equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I, I know I've heard from a lot of different podcasts that I listen to or public speakers or just public figures around the world. I mean, I know David Chang, the well-renowned chef, has talked about this and, and kind of coming to terms with his heritage and being a kid here in the United States, it was difficult for him. I've heard Joanna Gaines, the designer, she talks about her mother who is a Korean and, and kind of struggling and finding that identity later on. So it's a really interesting thing. You were the oldest of four girls. Did leadership come natural to you? Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I mean, inevitably, as the oldest daughter, um, I was the repository of all of my parents' ambitions. Uh, my mother was tiger mother par excellence. <laughs> my childhood was subject to a lot of academic pressure. It was very much come top of the class, you don't come home. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was not, to be frank, a lot of fun. But it was all worth it when, entirely because of my parents' desire that I do so, I, I managed to get into Oxford. And... You know, um, all of those years of pressure, um, you know, were, were very much about fulfilling my parents' ambitions. You know, I was told I was going to Oxford. Mm -hmm. I had no choice. But the moment I landed there in 1977, I was so grateful for all of that pushing because, you know, it was a privilege and an honour to go to University of Oxford. I had an amazing three years there. It's opened doors for me ever since. You know, I'm, I met a fantastic network of friends and we're still friends to this day. And so, you know, in retrospect, I'm very grateful to my parents for pushing me. But at the time, it was not fun. But when you were there, you studied English literature and, and you fell in love with theater. Did that have anything to do, you know, performance? What, what about that love and finding theater really, really impacted you? So, um, it, so yeah, Oxford opened my eyes to a lot of things I had not had mm -hmm. the opportunity to engage with, and, and theatre was one of them. And um, actually, uh, um, within this, um, I do want to pay tribute to my college at Oxford, um, Somerville, which was founded in 1879 as one of a small handful of colleges for women who, who had not been allowed to attend Oxford. Okay. Um, and in fact, even when the all women's colleges formed, women were not allowed to graduate from Oxford until decades later. And so um, Somerville College is named after Mary Somerville, the woman who actually defined the term scientist. It was created for her. She was the, the tutor to Ada Lovelace, who invented computing. Yep. And that pioneering spirit um, absolutely fed through into its students. And mm -hmm. so Somerville encouraged you to really express yourself and find yourself in all sorts of wonderful ways. And, you know, I, I just came upon the Oxford student drama scene and loved everything about it. And so I, I did everything. I was president of the Somerville Drama Society. I wrote, acted, directed, stage managed. And I decided that all I wanted to do was work in theatre for the rest of my life. But I knew I wasn't good enough to be an actress or director. 
And I used to draw a lot when I was younger. And my friends um, pulled me into designing theatre posters for their shows. And from there I got sucked into promoting their shows. And I really enjoyed that. And so ultimately I became a marketing and publicity officer in theatre because of that. And to go off that, your mantra is you will never own the future if you care what people think. In those first few years of, you know, getting into advertising, even being in theater, did you, you know, is that where you kind of developed that thick skin, and that, that creativity? No, not at all. Um, I was as rampantly insecure in my 20s and 30s as any other woman is. I mean, essentially, when we are born as women, everything around us conspires to make us feel insecure about absolutely everything to do with ourselves. The way we look, the way we talk, the way we dress, nice girls do this, nice girls don't do that. We spend the rest of our lives coming back from that, and some of us never do. And so people regularly ask me, Cindy, what was it that made you as confident as I appear to be today? And honestly, it's 59 years of life. It's life experience that led me to the point where I say the best moment of my life was the day I realised I no longer give a damn what anybody thinks. But truthfully, it wasn't a single moment. It was a gradual realisation But that is the only way to live your life. And I very much want to shortcut that process for younger women because I would have loved to have gotten to that realization a whole lot earlier myself. In 2005, you left PBH and you struck it on your own. And you're the founder uh, and CEO of ifweranetheworld.com, which is a co-action software that helps brands and businesses to use shared values and shared action for good, communication through demonstration. If We Ran the World also teamed up with Levi's, which was here just a few weeks ago for its IPO. On their campaign, this was a few years ago, to feature the town of Braddock, Pennsylvania and really show the uh, townspeople and the workers there. It is a steel town in in Pennsylvania wearing Levi's and, and working. So can you walk us through that kind of case study and what you did with them? Sure, because it wasn't quite like that. Um, So If We Run The World came out of my now over 30 years working in advertising and believing very strongly, therefore, that the future of business is doing good and making money simultaneously. And not in the old world order way that most companies currently do this, which goes, we make money here and then we do good by writing checks to causes to clear our conscience over here. But the new world order way of we make money because we do good. We find a way to integrate social responsibility into the way that we do business on a day-to-day basis that therefore makes it a key driver of future growth and profitability. And so I believe that the business model of the future is shared values plus shared action equals shared profit, financial profit and social profit. Mm -hmm. In other words, when brands and businesses come together with their audiences, and those may be consumers, employees, analysts, on the basis of values that you all share, which, by the way, is the most important requirement for good relationship in life as much as business. Mm -hmm. You'll never truly bond with someone who don't share the same values. So when you come together around shared values and you are then enabled to collectively and collaboratively co-act on those values, i.e. walk the talk together, you can then make things happen in the real world that will benefit consumers, benefit society, and benefit the brand and its business. And so if we around the world enables brands and businesses to come together with their audiences to do that. And so when I spoke to Levi's, you know, back, gosh, I mean, this was, you know, something like nine years ago now. Yeah, 2009, 2010. Yep. What I talked to them about was the fact that their core audience, millennials, were at the time, you know, um, especially in the wake of the financial crash, experiencing a real backlash against Wall Street, where we are now, you know, to corporate greed as they saw it. And there was correspondingly a real appreciation of blue collar work, getting your hands dirty, honest labor, you know, an honest day's labor for an honest day's pay. And that drove a lot of movements like a real interest in, you know, organic farming, urban gardening, back Mm -hmm. to the land. And so what I said to Levi's was that you have the opportunity to actually bring your audience together with you on the basis of these of these shared values because you are the company that created what you wear when you do that honest day's labor, you know, Levi's jeans. Mm-hmm. And so together with Levi's and the agency One Kennedy, we identified this opportunity for Levi's to put their values into action, to actually work with this devastatingly poor town Braddock 
to rebuild the town and the community together with, I mean, the, the mayor of Braddock, one of the youngest mayors in America, right. you know, absolutely rebuilding the community from the ground up and to invite Levi's millennial audience to actually co-act and do this together. And you had the opportunity to actually come and work in Braddock if you wanted to. We created the atomic unit of around the world's micro-actions, you know, that make things really easy to do. You could come and, you know, help, you know, paint the library, work on Braddock Farms, but you could also help from further away. You know, you could contribute to Amazon wish lists that the various institutions of Braddock created. And so the whole idea was you work on the, you, you co-act on these shared values and what do you wear while you're doing them? You wear the original jeans that were created for exactly this purpose, mm -hmm. for hard work and honest labour and you know, represent, therefore, fundamental American values. And the reason that's important, by the way, is because, you know, this is an exercise that neither individuals nor companies do enough. So my startups are designed around my own philosophies, one mm -hmm. of which is that everything in life and business starts with you and your values. And so the single most important starting point for everything, whether you're a person or a business, is to look into yourself and to ask yourself, what do I value? Mm -hmm. What do I believe in? What do I stand for? What am I all about? And then to absolutely have that determine the way you go forwards. Because honestly, the secret of happiness is living your life and working your work according to your own values. And I know that Levi's, if you go in now, they've had some different organizational changes and I think they brought in new you know members of the team but now if you go on it's it's really interesting to see that they're very transparent about where they donate money where their money goes to organizations that they are supporting it's right you know it hits you right at the website so it's been interesting to watch that change too. Um, no, and I must pay tribute to their amazing chief marketing officer, Jen Say, yes. um, who, who actually was a client of mine, you know, b b back in the days when at BBH, mm -hmm. um, I oversaw the Levi's business. But I've been particularly admiring of the fact that Jen, based on her own past mm -hmm. as a gymnast, yes, right. has been especially vocal on the subject of Me Too in the gymnastics world and the appalling mm -hmm. Larry Nasser case. And she was speaking out about all of that years and years and years before anybody saw the truth of what she and all of her fellow gymnasts were saying. And, you know, I'm so in awe of how amazingly brave she's been and how she mm -hmm. continues to be an outspoken champion for, yeah. you know, diversity in all these areas. Are there any companies, you know, Levi's aside, that you see right now and you're like, wow, they're you know, that's how you do it. They're really nailing their values, they're open about it, or they're doing something in a very creative way that's uh, engaging with consumers. Do you know, depressingly, um, the answer is no, I can't think of a single one. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the reason for that is that, regrettably, in the corporate world, it's very easy to give the appearance of doing something without actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And this is a point I make constantly. Don't talk about diversity. Don't create inspirational, emotional, compelling campaigns about diversity. Don't do stunts about diversity, just be diverse. And there are an awful lot of companies doing all of the former mm -hmm. and very, very few doing the latter. I want to get your take on something that's going on right now. It's June and we are in Pride Month. And I live in New York. I walk down the street every day to the subway. I take Ubers, and it's been really interesting to see because I would say about two weeks ago, the kickoff of the month, all of a sudden it was it was rainbows everywhere, which obviously I think equality is something that should be supported, should be out front, you know, happy to see that. But from an advertising perspective, it's been interesting to see storefronts and retailers that have different campaigns going on right now in, in support of Pride. Even Uber, you know, you can track your car and it's a it's a rainbow line that shows you how far your car is away. Again, just kind of very interesting creative tactics. And what I want to, you know, just get your opinion on is, do you think this has a lasting impact? Is it something that more and more people are becoming accepting of, that more and more people will say, hey, this company supports equality. This is something I, I share my values in. Or do you think it's something that they're doing to kind of follow the status quo and they feel like we need to do this because, because it's June? Um, absolutely the latter. So everything I just said mm. applies to what we are currently seeing around us in Pride Month as well. You know, I can tell you that LGBTQ people in advertising are massively discriminated against. Mm. 
um, for many years, um, a number of my friends, you know, d did not dare to identify themselves for who they really were. You know, I, I've had friends and colleagues who have, you know, let people think their partner was the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And so, again, there is a huge amount of rainbow washing going on. And that is why, you know, I, I tweeted about this just a couple of days ago because the BBC reported on that horrific case in London right. of the lesbian couple who on were attacked and beaten up on, on a bus mm -hmm. by a group of young men. And there were these horrific photos of them, you know, covered in blood and, and battered. And I tweeted that out and I said, you know, agencies, brands, you know, don't put pride all over your advertising, hire and promote LGBTQ people and put them in leadership so that together we can work to change this forever. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was very important to say that with that image, because um, especially, by the way, if you are, you know, a brand headquartered in a relatively urban area, let's say New York based, San Francisco based, Los Angeles based, you you really don't see for yourself the reality behind why pride is so important, which is that, you know, on the streets of London, a lesbian couple can be attacked and viciously beaten up for simply being two women together. And so I urge companies and brands to, I mean, quite frankly, Forget the pride branding. I'm all about communication through demonstration. Mm -hmm. Do it. And then by all means, put that out there. Right. When you can point to your, you know, LGBTQ leadership team, your CEO, when you can, when you can point to how your LGBTQ employees say this is the best place for all of us to work, you know, that's your pride branding right there, not putting the rainbow flag on everything in the month of June. Last week, you published an article in Ad Age on ageism. You outline actions businesses can take to end ageism and reshape the culture, just as you've mentioned. Some points on that, you said, say your age, hire the biggest growth driver for our industry, which is expertise. And when you're told the target is youth and millennials, for branders and marketers, say why? Why shouldn't you know it, it be an older crowd? What do you have to say about that? So I'm a very action-oriented person, and I've been championing age in our industry and, and in business generally for years, because and, and it's important to say this, by the way, you know, all of the work I do in this area is because I am a hard-headed businesswoman. And I cannot believe the enormous amount of money every single industry is leaving on the table by not being diverse. You know, my industry thinks its glory days are over, that the golden era of Madison Avenue is behind us. Mm -hmm. My industry's glory days have not even begun because we have not even begun to see what advertising could be when it deploys the talent and creativity and skills of women, people of color, LGBTQ, the disabled, older people. So um, I basically have spent quite a long time talking to a lot of people in my industry and beyond about ageism. And it's interesting because, you know, th this, this, is, this is the one ism that has had a lot less attention paid to it, but affects all of us because we all age. And so increasingly, more and more people are speaking out about it. But there are a lot of pieces about how awful it is and how inhibiting it is to the economy and how traumatizing it is to older Americans. But there are very few pieces saying this is exactly what you do about it in a way that is enormously actionable for anybody and everybody. And so after months of having conversations, you know, dinner salons with leaders in our industry and loads of people writing to me as they saw me speaking out about this more and more, that piece in Ad Age, and I encourage your listeners to go and check it out, it's called Eight Ways to Turn Ageism on Its Head. Mm -hmm is a list of actions and micro actions that anybody and everyone can take at whatever level of a company to change this. And I'm asking everyone to do that. And while the list is specifically tailored for the advertising industry, and, and the reason for that, by the way, is because we are a hugely influential force in popular culture. Absolutely. You know, what we reflect about aging in advertising absolutely shapes general public attitudes, behaviours and, and opinions. And so this is why it's so particularly important my industry addresses this. Mm -hmm. But actually that list of actions is totally extrapolatable out to every other industry. And so, 
you know, um, the important thing, too, is to realize that ageism impacts at every single point along the age spectrum. You can be dismissed for being too young as much as you're dismissed for being too old. And so it behoves every one of us to do everything we can to change this every Mm -hmm. single day. I mean, to your point, you said that advertising is one of the most powerful forces. It really can change public opinion and perception. But to your point, to go back a little bit, you also said that the industry is saying our, our glory days are over. You know, there's issue areas and we're seeing cracks. How do you think that the advertising industry will change? Because obviously you have Netflix, you have Amazon Prime. People aren't maybe tuning into regular cable TV as much and seeing those ads like they used to. It's just media is changing the way we we get videos, the way we consume things are, are changing. But one has to think there's still going to be advertising one way or another. But it, it does have to change. How do you see that change happening in the you know 21st century? Right. First of all, by the way, let me just say that the reason I do what I do is because I bloody love advertising. I bloody love my industry. Advertising at its best is an enormously powerful force. And there are many ways in which that force can be used for good and to make money simultaneously, which obviously is my philosophy. But um, you've just asked that question in the passive tense. All of this changes when I and everyone else in advertising make it change. And I don't wait for things to change. I make them change. So I have, quite frankly, given up trying to change the advertising industry from within. And so I now urge women, people of color, LGBTQ, Mm -hmm. the older, disabled, everyone deemed other, to actually start their own industry, to start their own businesses, to take a long, hard look at the industry, identify what it is that they think is missing, how they would do things differently, what they could bring to the table that is not there, and start their own agencies. And I put the word agencies in inverted commas, because I don't mean by that agencies like the ones we see around us currently. I mean, start something that gives you agency to invent the future the way that you want to. And I'm happy to say that I've been putting this call out now for several years, and at the same time encouraging people who start their own businesses because of that call to tell me about them, because I celebrate them at every opportunity. And more and more people, especially women, are absolutely now inventing the advertising industry of the future. And boy, oh boy, are those the people to invest in, because they know where the future is and they will take you there. Are there any women that are high on your radar that you, you like mm. to follow? or uh, um, Absolutely. So let me, let me recommend Judy Shapiro. So Judy is an older woman in mm. advertising. She's an ad tech specialist. She has a brilliant ad tech platform called Engage Simply. And by the way, I really recommend um, to your listeners, check that out, because it is an example of the female lens on the ad tech world, which otherwise is appallingly riddled with fraud and disgusting unethical behavior. So um, Judy got so frustrated that she did something I've been urging women to do um, for years. She has started the female founded holding company of the future, Mm -hmm. and it's called the Trust Web. Because what she is building is a holding company of ad tech companies designed to be the future of our industry focused on trust. And wow, do we ever need to rebuild trust in the industry right now? This is what clients need. They need to know that they can absolutely have this, especially, by the way, again, in the ad tech world. And so the work Judy is doing is, is phenomenal. And I highly recommend that your listeners check her out. Very cool. Be sure to check her out. You said you prefer Twitter over Instagram as you are a verbal rather than necessarily visual person. Case in point, you've got nearly 70,000 Twitter followers and nearly 190,000 tweets. Absolutely growing. I've been looking at your page all day and it just kept refreshing and refreshing. (laughs) I don't know how you do it. While you've never posted on Instagram, you also have 2,000 people just waiting for your first picture there. But you've used that as your microphone. And, you know, like I said, even though you left the advertising corporation and, uh, you know, the structure there, you've certainly become a powerhouse in your own right. What is it about, you know, Twitter and that community that you've been able to kind of build out and connect with people? Well, the way I use Twitter, and this is something I recommend to people generally. My office is based at um, Neuhaus mm. on 25th Park. And I, I did a talk for Neuhaus, which you can find on YouTube, called um, Building Your Personal Brand. And the point I make there is that I'm just being myself on Twitter. I have never set out to get more followers. I'm, I'm just living my life on social media in the same way that I live my life every day. And, and by the way, I've integrated social media into how I do that. 
And I recommend that to everyone, especially, again, by the way, my industry advertising, because you wouldn't believe the number of agency leaders pronouncing on social media who are not on it, by the way, or not using it in the mm -hmm. way they should. And you cannot understand the appeal of social media unless you really have integrated it into um, your daily life. But, but yeah, I mean, all, all I'm doing is being myself. You know, as, as you will have seen, I put out a mix of things I feel strongly about, mm -hmm. things to do with my startups, my life, you mm -hmm. know, glimpses into it, sure. things that I think are funny. I don't care if other people do or don't. <laughs> I think they're funny. I'm going to put them out there in case other people do, you know. And people, I mean, the people who follow me like that, right. you know. Um, and so the interesting thing I've observed is that um, 70,000 followers on Twitter is not a big following compared to a ton of people with... Right. But I have a very engaged following. And, and so things that I want to spread, do spread. Um, and again, I suspect, by the way, because um, actually my, my, my followers are pretty evenly divided between men and women, but the women especially, um, and, and again, the work I do on gender equality, diversity, inclusion, obviously strikes a chord there, are sharing what I put out there in a way that really helps me, you know, get those messages out to more and more audiences. And, and I love that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm just being me. That's very cool. And I know that, you know, our colleagues here, at New York Stock Exchange and ICE, they would they would absolutely trumpet the horn for engagement and, and really having great dialogues and have people sharing and, and be aware that way instead of just having these incredibly massive followings, but it's you're really just mm. speaking into the the uh, the black yeah. hole there. So so I absolutely encourage that. You're also a very vocal proponent for closing the wage gap for women and I find that very interesting because I know as a young person myself, it's still such a taboo topic for, I think, both men and females, but especially females. I think people would rather tell you their gastrointestinal issues than discuss how much money they're making or what they could be making. And I don't know what strides kind of need to change there. And, and to your point, you know, you've said, ask for as much money as possible. And I definitely think when whether you're interviewing or you're going to your current boss and you're ready to ask for that raise, there's still this, you know, disease to please, and you don't you don't want to seem too aggressive, or, or you don't want to, you know, scare somebody off. But it's an interesting topic because it's important. So, um, yeah, this is a topic I feel very strongly about. People value you at the value you are seen to put on yourself, and that is why I recommend to people, especially women, the amount you always ask for is the highest amount you can say out loud without actually bursting out laughing. And I can tell you that literally every week I hear from women who say, Cindy, I did that and it worked. You know, a woman wrote to me not that long ago and said, you know, my pay and performance review was due. I know this is your advice. You know, I thought, oh, I can't do that. You know, I went in fear and trembling. You know, I did it. And I basically, you know, not only did I get the number I asked for, I got another so many thousand dollars on top of that. I basically doubled my salary because of you. Like, you know, so it, it absolutely works. And, and by the way, um, for your listeners, anybody who, you know, is in some doubt about how to put this into action, CindyBot can help. So two years Cindy ago, Bot. CindyBot, this? yeah. So two years ago for Equal Pay Day, mm -hmm. RGA, the interactive agency, with the help of several partners, Reply.ai technology, Ladies Get Paid, Payscale um, for, for the data, right. turned me into a chatbot. So basically, um, I, I'm, I'm built on top of Facebook Messenger. And, and incidentally, I'm so impressed with the job they did because they researched the hell out of me. And so go to the Facebook page that is called Ask Cindy Gallup and message me there. Okay. And I tell women how to ask for a raise. And so, you know, um, you do things like, you know, I will say, OK, right, terrific. You know, what do you do? And, and you fill in your, you know, occupation. Then I go, OK, so where, do, where are you based? And you put in your zip code and I will say something like, OK, you know, in this area, you know, people doing occupation normally make bleh, but you're not normal, are you? So we're going to ask for a damn sight more. And, and, and so literally, um, I talk you through exactly how to ask the raise. And you can enter, you know, you have options like, but what if they say this? OK, this is what you do. It's my voice. So be warned, there are four letter words um, <laughs> that, that proliferate. And, and actually, Facebook themselves said it was one of the best uses of bot technology that they'd seen um, built on Messenger because it, it, it is so human. And so, um, and so again, a number of women have written to me saying, you know, I use that. I sent it to my whole team because it was so brilliant. Wow. So, um, so Cindy Bot is here to help you get the pay raise you deserve. She's still active. <laughs> they can oh, yeah, still yeah, 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 ye
I saw last night as I was trying to keep up with you on Twitter that you were tweeting about the Tonys, which for our listeners is the award in Broadway theater excellence. And I, for one, do not get it to the theater nearly enough. I would like to. But I want to listen to a clip from Rachel Chavkin. Oh, my God. Chavkin. Her speech was Ch- Chavkin. Yep. Her yes. speech was fan bloody tastic. Let's take a listen. And so is walking out of hell. That's what is at the heart of the show. It's about whether you can keep faith when you are made to feel alone. And it reminds us that that is how power structures try to maintain control, by making you feel like you're walking alone in the darkness, even when your partner is right there at your back. And this is why I wish I wasn't the only woman directing a musical on Broadway this season. There are so many women who are ready to go. There are so many artists of color who are ready to go, and we need to see that racial diversity and gender diversity reflected in our critical establishment, too. This is not a pipeline issue. It is a failure of imagination by a field whose job is to imagine the way the world could be. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that sent shivers down my spine all over again. She won Best Director for a musical, Hades Town, and I mean, when I heard those words, it was, it's just striking because you, you think for a minute, how is that possible? How, how are there no other female directors on Broadway? I mean... Oh, and do you know, Hades Town and the way it swept the tonus last night is did. a fantastic demonstration of how quickly all of this changes when you put women in leadership. Mm-hmm. Because um, Hades Town also won um, the best score, Tony, for its composer and writer, Anais Mitchell, Mm -hmm. who began workshopping it in Vermont, something extraordinary like, gosh, uh, 13 years ago. I think it's um, it's it's had a very long journey to the Tonys. And during the Tonys, while they don't show people accepting these, get glimpses of the earlier awards for craft skills. And so Hades won um, the Sound Design Award, and the, the sound designer was a man, but he, he came up to the podium with a woman and he said, anybody who works in sound design knows um, that the sound associates everybody. And, you know, I could not have done it without, I can't remember her name. It also, Hades Town also won the lighting design award. And, and the man, um, the lighting designer, came up and, and said at the podium, you know, Broadway is too white, too cis and too male. I mean, we need to change that. And um, it was a really interesting demonstration of how when you have women leading a production, you know, as the writer, as the director, they bring in other women, they bring in men who want to see gender equality, diversity, inclusion. And Hades Town at the Tonys last night demonstrated its own little ecosystem of how much all of this can change. And by the way, you know, when it comes to creative output, and I use this uh, analogy of my industry and Hollywood as much as theatre, but... When you have at the top a closed loop of white guys talking to white guys about other white guys, the creative output, the product you get, is Batman versus Superman, which, by the way, did not do well at the box office. (laughs) When you bring women and people of colour and you welcome them into, and I use the word advisedly, the room where it happens, what you get is Hamilton. People are waiting to do these things. I know, you know, friends and family members that that are fantastic actors and actresses and, and lighting designers, but you know, they may just not have those connections. You know, they're uh, they're reaching out. They're they're working in smaller theaters. They're trying to get these things in, in all kinds of different industries. But you have to have those people at the top, to your point, who aren't just saying, oh, diversity is great, and oh, this is great, and, you know, I feel good, a nice pat on the back. But but reaching out to those people when they connect with them on LinkedIn or they say, hey, you know, here's my video, or do something to give those people a chance. No, absolutely. You know, women need what men get all the time, which is somebody willing to go out on a limb for us. Right. And men get, get that all the time because when the leadership at the top is male, it's very easy for them to look at a younger man coming up the ranks and go, oh, I can see myself in him. Mm-hmm. He reminds me of myself at his age. He's great to hang out with. He's great to have a beer with. We reckon he can do the job. Let's give it to him. With a woman, there's a completely different set of standards. Well, has she done the job before? Mm -hmm. Has she done it long enough? Has she done it well enough? And men basically get hired, promoted, funded on potential. Women get hired, funded, promoted on proof and not even then. 
And so absolutely, we need people reaching out going, we want you in here. We want to see what you can do. We believe in you. When you believe in people, they will absolutely rise to that belief. After the break, Cindy and I discuss life after the agency and on to her life in entrepreneurship. And now a word from Teladoc, NYSC ticker TDOC. When I get sick, I'm too busy to reschedule my day. And that's why I use Teladoc. I don't need to wait. I can talk with a U.S. board-certified doctor by phone or video within minutes who can diagnose, treat, and prescribe medication for conditions like the flu, bronchitis, allergies, and more. For me, my family, even my coworkers, 24-7, anywhere, anytime. They've already connected over 4 million patients to get the care they need. So what are you waiting for? Visit teledoc.com. Back now with advertising legend Cindy Gallup. We've been talking about the history and impact of advertising past and present. One of my favorite documentaries of all time is called Art and Copy. It was a documentary that came out about 10 years ago, and it's all about the advertising industry. The first time I saw it, I, I swore I was going to go into advertising that night. I was like, this is what I was born to do. Life took a different turn for me. But I want to take a listen to advertising legend Lee Clow and hear about his first years in the advertising industry and also how he kind of changed his path, ended up at TBWA Shiat Day into the business, I was working for an agency who represented everything that's wrong with the advertising. It was run by a guy who basically was unscrupulous. He would do anything to keep a client. He would do anything to win a client. And he basically had mostly contempt for the entire creative department. It was this, how big do you want the logo, sir? All they cared about is milking money out of clients and giving them what they want, that kind of formula that makes for so much of the bad work in our industry. And it almost seemed deceitful to allow clients to dictate mediocre work and then pay us for it when we aspired to do something better. So I was the head of the escape committee because it was kind of like, we can't stay here. This is, this is the devil's workshop. We have to find our way into agencies that believe in the right stuff. And I was lucky enough to discover Shiat Day, which was just being born at this time. And Jay Shiat and Guy Day were the pirate spirit, rebel spirit that I was trying to champion over at this dopey agency. The guys who believed in the right stuff. Right before this clip, Lee talks about his love of surfing and his love of Southern California. And there's a passion there. And I see the same thing about your love for theater, your love for performance and for championing these rights. Do you think passion is the secret to success in this industry? Sadly not. Uh, I mean, quite frankly, at the moment, I'd say the secret of success in this industry is being a white male like Lee Clow is, because that will get you a damn sight further than actually anything else, creativity, talent and passion included. The, the real answer to your question is the key to success in my industry is not being a target of sexual harassment. And the reason I say that is because I've been speaking out against sexual harassment in advertising and in business generally for years, um, mm -hmm. well before Me Too. I spoke about it publicly because nobody else would. When the Harvey Weinstein saga broke back in fall of 2017, I thought maybe now I can finally get women to speak up on the record, name names, in the same way those brave women did. And I put a call out on Facebook. And by the way, without thinking a great deal about it, I just posted and said... You know, women of the advertising industry of the time has come to call out the Harvey Weinsteins of our industry. You know, um, email me, name names, I will help you break those stories. And I was inundated. An absolute avalanche of emails showed up in my inbox. They were global, by the way. I'd always known it was bad. I'd never known it was that bad. And what I saw, and continue to see, by the way, because people are still writing to me, completely changed my own thinking. Up until that point, I had thought that the biggest business issue facing our industry was diversity. I realized it wasn't, and I've been saying this publicly ever since. The single biggest business issue facing the advertising industry and every other industry is sexual harassment. Because sexual harassment manages women out of every industry. Mm -hmm. It derails women's careers, it destroys women's ambitions, it crushes women's dreams. And so sexual harassment prevents from getting into leadership and power and influence the female leaders who would make equality, diversity and inclusion happen. And so 
our industry in terms of who gets to succeed is massively imbalanced because I've seen the stories of all the female creativity and talent and skills that our industry has hemorrhaged over decades because of sexual harassment. And so the playing field is absolutely not level. And if you are somebody who will never be a target of that and have nothing to fear from retaliation and and intimidation and all sorts of truly appalling behavior, again, that I've absolutely seen laid out before me in multitudes, mm -hmm. then you're already way ahead of all the people who will never make it because of that. And to, I mean, to that point, like, how do you see that changing? Obviously, I mean, women will keep working their way up the ladder, women helping women. But in terms of them finding success, do you see that in, in female run agencies? I mean, literally females hmm. starting their own, just kind of like the, the VC world, for example, was shaken by that. There have been VC venture capitalists who started Me Too movement. They started All Raise, for example. And there have been more female-founded venture capital firms coming out and helping each other or, or only investing in you know, female-led companies and things like that. I mean, is that how you see success happening for women, um, taking it upon themselves? I um, mean, um, unfortunately, yes. And I say unfortunately because it doesn't matter how many female-founded venture funds you start. Mm -hmm none of them for a long time will have anything remotely like the billions of dollars that the white male held venture funds do. But yeah, but I absolutely exhort women, as I said earlier, to start their own businesses. But I urge women to absolutely go out there unashamedly determined to make a huge amount of money. Because when we make a huge amount of money, we can then fund other women. Mm -hmm. We can support other women. We can help other women. We can donate to other women. We need to build our own financial ecosystem because the white male one isn't working for us. And so, yup, absolutely, women who start businesses and hire other women create the kind of working environments that, that women want to be in. But, you know, th th there, are, there are essentially two very easy solutions to sexual harassment that I wish the mainstream w would adopt. And the, the ir ir irony of this is that, you know, the men at the top don't realise how... If they were just to do this, it would make their own lives so much easier. Two solutions to sexual harassment. Number one, make every single working environment at every single level of your company gender equal or more female than male. Because sexual harassment magically disappears in gender equal environments. And that's because, A, in a non-male dominant environment, there is no longer the implicit bro endorsement all around you, it's okay to behave like that. And B, when in a gender equal work environment, men engage with women every day as professional equals, are exposed to women's brilliance, insights, capabilities, talent, skills, men cease to see women in one of only two roles, girlfriend or secretary. So that's the first thing you do to solve sexual harassment. Make every level of your company gender equal. Whoosh, gone. No problems. The second thing you do is what my other startup, Make Love Not Porn, is all about, which is promote a culture, a gold standard of good sexual values and good sexual behavior as much as you promote culturally good values and good behavior in every other area within your company. Mm -hmm. Because this is the one area of universal human behavior and experience that we do not hold people to a public openly, universally understood gold standard in the same way we do every other form of behavior. So I urge leaders, you know, talk about this as part of your culture as much as talk about everything else. At this company, here are our expectations. You know, these are our values and these are our sexual values and these are expectations of our employees and this is the culture. And if you contravene in any way, you're out. This morning, as one of many tweets and retweets that I saw online from you, you quoted venture capitalist Fred Wilson. Some background, he is the co-founder of Union Square Ventures, and he publishes a blog, which I'd recommend checking out, called AVC, Musings of a VC in New York, which you can receive daily via email. But in today's blog post, he talked about early stage VC investments and says, one of the great truths about early stage investments is that you have to be patient with them. The, the losses come early and the winners take longer to realize. It takes seven to 10 years to get real liquidity in a portfolio of early stage venture investments. You can't cut it short, it just takes time. 
Become seven, eight, nine, and 10, the returns will start coming in. You tweeted out part of that quote. Are you starting to see the returns? Um, no, actually, I tweeted out that quote deliberately because it really resonated with me. You know, I am in this for the long haul. Mm-hmm. And essentially, um, I completely concurred with what, what Fred said there, which was, you know, I mean, obviously, especially in the venture capital world, there is too much expectation of instant gratification, right. you know, unrealistic pressure to scale. And, you know, again, as somebody fighting a very difficult battle with a sex tech startup, I have to be in this for the long haul because I have so many more obstacles than most people do. But that is also no bad thing because time is a very interesting business dynamic in a way that not enough people realize. Hmm. Completely separate to what you may be doing with your venture, the sheer passage of time changes things. You know, it moves attitudes. Markets rise and markets fall. Um, Time reshapes economies in a way that can then be leveraged over the longer term by ventures that have the ability to do so because they are playing the long game. So, you know, and what Fred said really resonated with me because, you know, A, I had to back burner if we ran the world when Make Love Not Porn blew up. Even I, superhuman as I am, cannot run two startups simultaneously. (laughs) But I absolutely want to go back to and reactivate if we ran the world because Mm -hmm. people keep asking me about it. I mean, there are people who absolutely get it and, Mm -hmm. and want to be a part of it. At the same time, you know, Make Love Not Porn operates in Silicon Valley's final investment frontier, you know. The three huge disruption opportunities in tech today are sex, cannabis, and the blockchain. And ironically, investors are flooding into the other two more than they are the first, which has way more gigantic unicorn and market potential. So I absolutely have to be in it for the long haul. I mean, Make Love at Porn has only been going as a business for six years. And so, you know, again, I liked Fred's equation, you know, in that context. But I'm just a great believer in you know, not looking purely for quick wins, taking a long-term view and essentially just keeping going until you can find the points to leverage to your advantage that really enable you to succeed. We had Andreessen Horowitz's Scott Cooper on the podcast recently, and, and one of the themes that we discussed was timing, both from, like you said, being in it for the long haul, but then also mm. just Sometimes you're five years early on something or you're five years too late and sometimes you're right on the money or or you just have to wait or you just have to... Exactly. And that's why I love, you know, and I think I read this as, you know, one of Confucius' sayings, but many things attributed to Confucius he didn't necessarily say. But, but, <laughs> but, okay. but I love this saying, which is, it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. Couldn't agree more. You got to just keep going. That's how I, that's how I feel about running. As we wrap up, Sunday, I can hardly keep up with your multitude of projects and ability to seemingly be so many places at once. To go off of what you said about stress, what keeps you sane in the midst of all this craziness? Do you know, I'm a huge fan of doing nothing. Really? Doing nothing is massively underrated. So I've just spent a large part of this past weekend doing nothing. And, and by the way, as an entrepreneur, you're always working. And so, you know, I did, you know, a certain amount of work. But it's also very important to just, you know, pot around in your apartment doing nothing. Or in my case, you know, lie on the roof terrace I'm lucky enough to have and sunbathe and, and do nothing. And so I, I absolutely factor into my schedule, you know, moments, pauses, time, to do nothing. Um, Another aspect of this, which I'm also a very big fan of, is sleep. Mm. The single best piece of advice I ever got, and I can't remember who who said this to me, was get more sleep. And sleep solves an awful lot of things. You know, I'm very fond of saying that every situation in business and in life, especially startup life, can be summed up by a quote from Macbeth. The one that um, frequently comes to mind in startup stress land is each new morn some fresh horror brings. But in the context of what we're talking about now, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. You know, um, it, sleep, sleep solves a lot of things when you're an entrepreneur. A good night's sleep enables you to look much more clear sightly at problems in the morning. A good night's sleep just makes you feel better. So I'm a big fan of doing nothing and sleep. Cindy, I can't think of a better note to end on than that. And it's, a, it's a rainy Monday here, so it's perfect for some sleep. 
But thank you again for joining us, and thank you, Cindy, for coming inside the Ice House. Absolute pleasure. And if any of your listeners um, are interested in funding um, and backing me um, and my startups, then please email Cindy at ifweranTheWorld.com. I'd love to hear from you. Yes, and if you want to follow you on Twitter, I believe it's at Cindy Gallup. It is indeed. Right, that's Cindy and then G-A-L-L-O-P. Thanks so much, Cindy, for joining us inside the Ice House. That's our conversation this week. Our guest was advertising consultant and entrepreneur Cindy Gallup. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. Got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show? Email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show was produced by Pete Ash with production assistance from Stephen Romanchek and Ian Wolf. I'm Teresa DeLuca signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 